passage on page four, so that's section five of the preface, um, where Nietzsche talks about, he's been talking about the um, development, his own thinking about um, the question that he's addressing here. Um, and how the question about the artist and good and evil uh, was transformed in his mind. And finally we get to this passage. Um, the, issue, the issue for me, he says, was the value of italicized that morality. Um, and over this I had to struggle almost solely with my great teacher Schopenhauer, struggling against his initial uh, thoughts under the Schopenhauer, to whom that book, The Passion and the Secret Contradiction, that book was directed um, as if to a contemporary. In particular, the issue was the value of, he says, the unegoistic of the instincts of compassion, self-denial, self-sacrifice. These are, he says, precisely the passions that, um, the instincts that Schopenhauer had praised, gilded, deified made otherworldly, until finally they alone were left to, for him as the values in themselves of what is intrinsically valuable are self-denial, compassion, uh, self-sacrifice, unegoistic actions. Those are what's valuable in themselves, on the basis of which he, Schopenhauer, said no to life and also to himself. But against precisely these instincts, Nietzsche begins to rebel and to see them as the path to this great danger of societies and civilizations that take those to be their fundamental value, things that are valuable. So ultimately leading perhaps, and he italicizes this at the end of that passage, to nihilism. Okay, so um, the claim seems to be that this system of values that places self-denial, compassion, uh, um, non-egoistic action, self-sacrifice, at the core of what's valuable, these lead to, perhaps, to nihilism. Uh, and this is, these are the essential elements of what Nietzsche identifies as the moral system of values. Um, this system of morality is at its core saying no to life. And the worry is, one of the worries, is that placing these values at the core of system of values um, is the beginning of a turn against life, ultimately to nihilism. All right, so I want to ask you, uh, So the question is um, whether Kant is a good example of Kant's uh, system of values, whether it's a good example of what Nietzsche is describing as a moral system of values that places at its core self-denial, compassion, saying no to life, um, that Nietzsche is going to worry uh, leads to nihilism. Uh, 
Um, I'll say, I, so I want to talk about this a little bit because, because Kant's a really interesting case here. Um, and there are some things that he says on each side of this kind of question. What is clear, I think, is that um, Nietzsche is identifying him as part of this tradition. So pretty clearly, um, Nietzsche thinks of Kant as being a sophisticated philosophical elaboration of this, say, no to life and praising self-denial um, and uh, self-sacrifice. Um, So, so I, I, I want to talk about that a little bit, but I want to mention one other thing first. And that is that the word that's here translated as compassion is often also translated as pity. And the German word that's sometimes rendered as pity, sometimes as compassion, is mitleid. Um, and the German mitleid uh, has two parts, mit and leid. Mit in German means with. Leid means suffering. So in German, the literal uh, translation of the word that's translated as pity or as compassion literally would be translated something like this with suffering, that is, suffering with somebody else. So when you pity somebody, what's going on, or when you have compassion for somebody, what's going on is they are suffering, and you then are suffering with them. Okay. Um, and, well, um, one thing that's quite striking about Kant is that um, is what he says about pity. Um, so here's um, from the Metaphysics of Morals, page, in this translation, 204 to 205. So this is in the Doctrine of Virtue, section 34. And you can sort of already anticipate that Kant is going to have a complicated relation here because with suffering, pity or compassion, is for sure feeling. Right? It's when somebody is feeling bad, feeling that they're suffering, somehow that feeling is transmitted to you. You're feeling bad with them. And feeling bad, well, that's not going to be the foundation for virtuous action. The sensuous uh, experience, the phenomenal experience of feeling a certain way is not going to be how he grounds morality. On the other hand, he does, Kant does think that we have moral sense, sense in the sense of being receptive, and that our moral sensibility is what tunes us in to the requirements of morality. So moral requirements for Kant are not grounded in our moral sense, but for finite rational beings, empirical rational beings like us, that moral sensibility is what tunes us into the demands of um, pure practical reason and morality. Okay, and here's what he says about pity in particular. He says, so again, section 34 of the Doctrine of Virtue, he says, sympathetic joy and sadness. So this is sympathy, this is our feelings. This is Kant talking about our moral feelings. Sympathetic joy and sadness are sensible feelings of pleasure or displeasure at another state of joy or pain. That is, shared feeling, sympathetic feeling. Nature, he says, has already implanted in human beings, in our natural existence, our phenomenal, empirical existence. Nature has already implanted in human beings 
receptivity to these feelings. But to use this as a means to promoting active and rational benevolence is still a particular, though only a conditional duty. Conditional for beings like us. It's not a requirement of pure practical reason. It's called the duty of humanity because a human being is regarded here not merely as a rational being, but also as an animal with empirical desires and inclinations <coughs> endowed with reason. Uh, and then he's explaining that that can't be the ground of moral obligation, um, but it only is something that attunes us to it. And then he says this, he says, in fact, when another suffers, and although I cannot help him, I let myself be infected by his pain through my imagination. Okay, so this is a case where somebody else is suffering, and I feel pity, for that person, even though I can't really help them, I can't do anything to relieve that suffering, so I suffer with them. I let myself be infected by his pain through my imagination. Then Kant says, two of us suffer, though the trouble really in nature affects only one. But there cannot possibly be a duty to increase the ills in the world, and so to do good from compassion, from myth. This would also be an insulting kind of beneficence, since it expresses the kind of benevolence one has towards some, someone unworthy, called pity. And this has no place in people's relations with one another, since they are not to make a display of their worthiness to be happy. In the next section, he talks about the, the duty to cultivate our sensitivity to other people. But here he's very clear that Pity, simply as a um, multiplication of suffering, infection of suffering, is something that he wants no part of, that this is not something that's required. Um, okay. Um, another angle on Kant here. Um, Well, let me go back and forth a, a couple more times. I mean, so what does Kant say about happiness? Is he for it or against it? Like your own happiness, let's start with. Or start with other people's happiness. What does Kant think about that? So happiness is the satisfaction of our empirical, empirical, sensible design.